Hello and welcome to this special discussion which will talk on the plight of the people of Northern Borno Senatorial District. One can say without iota of doubt that in Borno State, the area which suffers the most debilitating underdevelopment with its attendant deterioration of the environment as well as massive loss of their settlements due to the encroachment of desert is northern Borno. This area comprises of 10 local government areas, namely Abadam, Damasak, Gubio, Guzamala, Kukawa, Magumeri, Marte, Mobar, Monguno, and Gansai. People living in these localities of northern part of Borno State are those who have not mostly felt the presence of government, hence the current state of their backwardness as compared to other parts of Borno State as well as Nigeria as a whole. Their situation was further compounded or worsened by the devastation and destruction caused by the Boko Haram insurgents, thereby making life unbearable for them, whereas some have become displaced. When even prior to the insurgency, these people whose livelihood can be compared to the Hobbesian state of nature, where people's lives were said to be nasty, poor, and short, and which is also a condition that was characterized by the wanton destruction caused by the Boko Haram insurgents, how then can the government help resettle and keep abreast and for these people to keep abreast with modernity. It is in the pursuit of this that uh, we have got some people to provide us with the proper understanding of the nature and scope of the problems hindering the development of the area under focus, as well as ex explore possible measures that will help in bringing about positive development to the people of Northern Borno. I have here with me some prominent scholars from the area who will help me to throw some light on how the Nigerian authorities, the state government, development partners, and all those concerned would help modernize Northern Borno and improve the quality and standard of the people that live in those areas. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Babagana Kazala Ali of the Center for Trans-Saharan Studies of the University of Maiduguri, who also holds the title of Zanna Dargamma of Borno, literally meaning the chief historian of Borno Emirate. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, also, here with me again, is Dr. Yagana Bukar, who is a lecturer from the University of Maiduguri, and uh, she has conducted a lot of studies on perennial uh, problem of water and the flight of women folk and how to empower the women folk socially, economically, in house trade as well as market oriented economy. She is from the Department of Geography. Dr. Yagana, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And also, we have Dr. Umar Goni of the Department of Education here with us, uh, who is also a lecturer from the University of Maiduguri. Doctor, you're welcome. Thank you very much. All the three academicians here with me were carefully selected on the basis of their familiarity of the area under discussion tonight. And it is therefore assumed that we stand a better chance to obtaining relevant information that will help us understand the scope and nature of the problem under review, as well as focus on the solutions required to help address the needs of the people of Northern Borno Senatorial District. So first, to begin with, Dr. Yagana Bukar, 
How would you describe the living condition of the people living in most parts of rural areas in northern Borno senatorial zone? Thank you very much. Um, as you have elaborated in the introduction, northern Borno state is an area that is by location in the extreme northern part of Borno state, and it is very vulnerable to the, all the vagaries of uh, extreme climate conditions. It is an area of um, below average rainfall, high temperatures, and very scarce natural resources, including water and uh, soil moisture in that regard. And so agricultural production is highly constrained as a result of low um, rainfall. And again, the vegetation in that area is also very scarce. It is in a semi-arid environment. And by nature, semi-arid environments are always um, very scarce of resources. And um, so people have to struggle harder than in other areas to survive in those environments. And in that regard, droughts and desertification, desert encroachments are some of the environmental problems faced by the people. And of course, because of its extreme location, there are also the presence of government in those areas, particularly the rural areas, is very minimal, such that um, you would find a lot of communities depending on one resource or on one water source, for instance, several villages in rural areas, 10 villages depending on one location, one centrally located water source. And that means people spend a huge amount of time trying to access water or other resources. So productivity in this area is below average. And so poverty is very, very extreme and widespread. And women who are major uh, household um, food security providers suffer a lot. And broadly, that has a lot of ramifications and implications, which I believe we'll continue in our discussion. Thank you. And the absence or non-availability of essential services, access roads, and other infrastructural facilities may have contributed to making most of the area deserted. How do you think that this situation will be reversed, Dr. Omar Goni? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, all the problems of our northern Borno is rooted, is rooted to one another. Uh, though the question you ask, I'm thinking you ask on education, something that uh, that has to do with education. How do we develop uh, uh, education in the, in the area? Not only I'm, education. I'm coming yes. to that. One. That's yes. it. We, we are, we'll come to that question. Later. That's fine. So uh, what I want to talk about is uh, we will want to talk about the, uh, the literacy, the literacy level of the people there. Uh, people might think uh, Northern Boros are illiterate, but it is not, simply because UNESCO came up with its own definition to say anybody that can read, write, and then have a little calculation, the person is literate. And if you are literate, I do believe you can be able to handle everything. You can harmonize, enhance whatever situation that you are in. And uh, uh, if we go back to the formal type of education that we're supposed to receive, actually, we have problem of our uh, classrooms, the schools we set, the schools were built there in the area, but uh, the occupant there, I can remember there was a time we went there for an evaluation we find out that uh, the classrooms were occupied by donkeys, uh, uh, horse, etc. 
Therefore, there is need for the local education authority and uh, Oron State uh, Teachers Service Board to employ more teachers. Well, before you go into that, yes. don't you feel that some of the factors that has been identified by Dr. Yagana, mm. for example, because of the uh, over-dependence of most families to have their child as well as all children, as well as women folk, mm. to go to a distance to fetch water and uh, you know, conduct some other domestic chores were also part of what has brought about you know, the, the impractability yeah. of you know, getting those children into school. Obviously it is. So uh, it is all related, so yeah, they yes, have to... Yes. yes. That's why uh, from the course of my discussion I want to bring in these things. Yes. Because, simply because yes. if we take one factor of attending classroom, for instance, yes. these children in the morning, they will go out to fetch water. And then normally we are expecting the, the, the footfuls and the students in the, school, in the school as early as possible. Uh, and they travel a long distance. Yes, they, they travel a Which will long consume distance. most of the time. Yes, it will, take, it will go to consume a lot of time before yes. they come back to. So in other words, it is not possible for them to go out, travel a longer distance to fetch water, and then come back and attend classroom. Thank you. So uh, even though... Um, most parts of the hinterland in northern Borno suffer one form of debilitating condition or the other. However, some areas are economically vibrant in terms of agriculture and also have huge economic potentials. But why do you think that the, uh, the exploitation of these potentials in some parts of northern Borno are not used to facilitate you know, the improvement of the living condition of the rural settlements. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, I want to, first of all, confess that um, I'm a complete song of Northern Burma. I was born in Damasak. My mother is from Geshegap. My father is from Gajiram Banzai. So Northern Burma owns me 100%, and I own Northern Burma 100%. Just like um, Dr. Yagana has highlighted, I would like to, as a historian, look at the human and uh, geographical setting of Northern Borno. Northern Borno, as she said, is a strip of land which stretches from Marche in the northeastern uh, part to Damasak in the northwestern part of the Sahel region. Um, the area is demographically populated by the Kanuri people. 90%. And um, Marche is a mixture of Shua and Kanuri. Abadam, uh, Dama, uh, Damasak are a mixture of uh, Maber and Badoi. Then Kukawa is Kanumbu. And, and Sugurti, um, Magumeri, Kaga, and Bubeo are a mixture of Badoi. Then um, uh, Nganze is a mixture of Kwayam and Badoi. Then the Shua Arabs uh, happened to be immigrants into Burma in the 19th century. We are also clustering around the Lake Chad to feed their livestock and sustain their livelihood. Um, the area, as Dr. Yagan has rightly mentioned, is bordering the Republic of Niger to the northwest, close to Difa through Damasak, and then to the northeast, close to both Niger and Chad through Boso. So the community are basically agro-pastoral uh, settlers by nature of their economic orientation. They depend on food crop production for subsistence and cash, and at the same time, they depend on livestock rearing. About 60% of the population there are agro-pastoral farmers, 20% are fishermen, and uh, about less than 5% are those in commerce and the civil service. Now, the pattern of settlement there has favored intensive agricultural economic activity, simply because um, it is dissected. Those settled to the northeast uh, of the lake chart are basically dependent on the uh, water of the lake for their 
livestock rearing and agricultural activity. Mostly after the rainy season, they practice irrigation agriculture by means of shadow. We call it Kwathara. Then those settled on the northwestern part of the district, uh, uh, senatorial district, uh, people around Damasak, Geshikar, Duji, Asaga, they are very settled very close to the river Yobe. So they, where they practice also another kind of irrigation agriculture, tomatoes, pepe, uh, vegetable crops, and what have you are uh, produced. But the major uh, impediment of these uh, agrofastoral communities is lack of access to modern farming implements. You see, the, the lake of the uh, the water of the lake, and then the water of the river Yobe is extremely exploited by the people to sustain livelihood. The area produces over one million metric tons of rice, uh, wheat, uh, and other legume crops, which are consumed both locally and those exported to other parts of the country. But because of very little government intervention, they are suffering. For example, I was in Bulakari uh, in the year 2004 when my grandmother died. F we sit from morning, uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning, and then um, go home around 6 p.m. If you see the, live the number of livestock passing from morning to that evening, you will be surprised. But this area lacks a single veterinary clinic for this livestock to be medically attended to or vaccinated. So this is another sorry side of uh, the agropastoral communities suffering there. There is lack of government, uh, government, proper government intervention in terms of machineries, but the people are really um, have really embraced farming as their social and economic uh, propensity or a kind of a way of life. Mm -hmm. So the issue of uh, road networks, yes, road networks are very poor. I saw the situation in the colonial era and even before the uh, around 1970s, when the colonialists came in order to regroup villages into a sort of social and economic unit to be producing food from the rural areas and to be transported into semi-urban areas, they provided what we call feeder roads. The, the meaning of feeder road is that these roads are linked between semi-urban centers and the rural areas so that what is produced in the rural area could be cheaply transported by local and modern means, um, mostly using in those days donkeys, horses, and oxen to transport food crops to the semi-urban areas, maybe mm. to the district capitals. Mm. And then um, gradually, the, uh, when this thing um, disappeared with the replacement of the native authority system with state system, some states managed to construct roads linking the various parts of northern Borno with Maiduguri. What we have now, as of 2003 and to 2011, was that the government of Senator Ali Sheriff was able to provide township roads in almost all parts of northern Borno. And then um, uh, thereafter, uh, the present government um, was actually willing, but it could not intervene rigorously in terms of assisting the people with road networks because of the uh, rapid spread of insurgency which spread from one locality to the other. Thank you. Yes. Well, and uh, when we look at uh, the area that we are talking about, a uh, lot of people emigrate from some other parts of Nigeria, especially from Sokoto, from Zamfara, from Cape B. You can find lorry lots of people to go and settle in those areas, particularly around Baga, Abadam, Malamfatori, and Damasak, to exploit the economy of those areas to their own advantage. What is stopping, Dr. Yagana, the people from those localities from also partaking in those activities? Is it because of their, um, because they are not properly mobilized? Is it because they are properly not motivated? Or what are the reasons behind their lack of interest in sort of uh, getting into those places to also partake in those economic activities, which has been exploited by other people? Um, I think uh, what I can say is that we cannot completely say that um, the economy or the exploitation of resources in that area is um, largely dominated by outsiders. 
the people of the area are also part of it. But considering that um, there is a very porous border, it is not only people from Sokoto and Zamfara streets that are found there, even people from Niger Republic and so on. And so that's why around the lectured area before the insurgency, there are almost about 20 million people exploiting the resources. Nobody can stop people within Nigeria. There is free movement of people from within Nigeria. Anybody is free to settle anywhere they want that is allowed under the law. And so because of um, some push factors in those areas that are also having similar problems but did not have that surface water, the abundance of surface water we have in northern Borno, as such, there is a lot of movement to that area and also population um, increase in those areas. And so there is a, the population is also compounding the problem. Huge populations depending on a limited or dwindling resource base. And in that regard, there is a lot of um, issues. The, the problems are enormous, has been highlighted by my colleagues uh, in this forum. And um, people in general are living below the poverty line. There is a uh, lack of uh, enough food, access to water, education, but, and so but, on. But don't you think that their uh, inability or lack of participation in exploiting the economic resource, some of the available economic resource in those areas, are also contributing to their sort of poverty? or their living standard, poor living standard? Poor living standard, yeah, it is contributing to the problem. But then, when you look at it, if we talk about lack of mobilization, of course that is one of the problems we have. But then, the people that are coming are also mostly illiterate, like our own people. But they are motivated. They are motivated. There's a lot of problems they are facing there. So our own ability or capability to seize opportunities uh, maybe lower, I can say. But then, even with that, for those that are participating, they are also um, reaping from it. But then, the problems are just so much, especially in a cultural setup. I studied women, and I know their problems in terms of a lack of access to resources in general, not just water, domestic water. Even in irrigation activities, you barely find women owning land, women um, very easily moving about with their husbands to go and settle in those areas that are more viable. For instance, what happens in some parts of the area is that during the dry season, there is absolutely no surface water. And so rural populations, in some cases, entire populations tend to move into the Lake Chad um, that, that also now brings me to another issue when you raised the matter of surface, lack of surface water. Mm. Um, I can recall that uh, when I, at one occasion, uh, was uh, privileged to, um, to go for an assignment as a, uh, as a reporter, I got this information from uh, one of those responsible for oil exploration around the Lecture area, Lecture Basin, precisely the Tuma One oil exploration when Professor Tam David West was the Minister for Petroleum Resources under the then Buhari regime in 1985, uh, was here together with the Managing Director of the NNPC, Dr. Arid Adams. The um, those that were assigned to explore the, uh, the, 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 the oil rig, Forex Shulum Baja, explained to them that uh, even though oil was not found in sufficient quantity in Tuma One oil exploration rig, that they have discovered something which is more valuable than oil, which is water. And water is in high demand in that area. So, their explanation was that the level of underground water that they found at Tuma One Oil Exploration Rig would provide water for the whole of the region. Then what would you think would be responsible for 
the lack of the determination of all the authorities in this country not to explore that and provide water to the people of that area. Precisely the question that is um, left for answers, that needs, that begs for an answer. Because if you talk about water situation, I've done it in a lot of forum about Northern Borno. The first question everybody asks me is, what is the role of your government? I have done that presentation even in an international um, for us. For, yeah. But the question that they kept asking was, what is the role of government? What is the government doing? To be fair to the government, I think um, water supply infrastructure has been provided in some places, particularly in the um, more urban areas of northern Borno. But the rural areas are not sufficiently um, provided. This is not we cannot just completely attribute that to the problem of government because the settlements are so scattered and isolated. We are coming to that. Okay. And uh, it is also believed that uh, when people are properly educated and enlightened, they will become active participants in the improvement of the quality and standard of their livelihood. Then what can be done to stimulate the people of Northern Borno to overcome the fears they have on Western education and become active participants in their own revival as well as recovery from neglect. Thank you very much. Dr. Omar Goni. Thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, uh, there is what is called motivation. Motivation is very, very significant. Motivation, uh, it should be given to both the parents and the students. So, parents should be motivated to take their children to schools. And then schools should be clearly built, and then it's uh, child-friendly. Then it will going to attract the students and then the football. It will accommodate the student and the football to be there in the, in the, in the schools. And uh, um, if we are going to talk about the modern schooling, there is what is called school mapping. And in school mapping, uh, the expert should go there and then locate the specific area where school should be built. Because you can't build school anywhere. School should be built in a place where it is not too far from the homes. And then it is not too close to the home. It shouldn't be in the market area. So, so that it will going to attract the attention of the, the learners in the classroom. And then secondly, and then secondly, the, 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 the student too should be motivated. I could remember during, uh, is it, uh, let, let Malaka Challa or something like this, things. students will be provided breakfast in school. And you know, the, the poverty level within the area that we're talking about. So if Something like breakfast is will going to be preferred to the student in a school for them to be there. They will going to go to schools and then participate actively. And then also uh, the little little thing like uh, uniform, exercise book, textbooks, etc. If these materials and equipment will be provided to the student, the student will be motivated to participate actively in the in the, in the school. And Going by the, the mapping that I talked about earlier, obviously, they are, uh, uh, after the looking at the area where you're supposed to build the school, then there are things you need to put in place. Things like water is necessary. The, the, the toiletry facilities are necessary. And then you have to Staff quarters for yeah, the teachers? Yeah, yeah. staff quarters to, to teachers is also very significant. And then you have to build, uh, plant a lot of trees. These things will motivate the learners because you're going to make the school very friendly. And conducive. And conducive for the learner yes. and then the, the teachers. So also, uh, uh, if such school is built, what are you doing? You are now um, employing people. The employment level will also increase. You employ people at the locality. 
the the, the get, uh, get get man or my god or whatever we're talking about okay they should be uh, dr omar also may i add to what he has just said <laughs> yes, please, in terms can. of education yes in my experience in my studies i found that um, there are some places where you go to and you actually find the structure yes. the school but then they don't have teachers mm -hmm. and then i asked some traditional rulers why why there, there are no students in the schools pupils in the school they tell me that their life revolves around looking for water, looking for food. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to take students to school. And besides, most of these teachers are kind of reluctant to go to those remote rural locations to stay there or live there, especially access roads. So these are some of the problems related to education. Mm -hmm. And so there was a village I went to and found that the headmaster of the village has married a second wife and has kept her inside a classroom because that's there was that. nothing else Sorry, to do. Sorry, that's why I, I, so I made mention of water. Highlight water that. within the school. Yeah. That's so it. Yes, that's, yes. Let me also highlight more on this issue of um, <coughs> bagwoness in terms of um, education. Sincerely speaking, in a similar manner um, with my colleagues, Dr. Yagana and Dr. Omar, I'm personally opposed to this issue of widespread construction of school in every locality. This is certainly quest, uh, costing government a lot of uh, expenditure, unnecessary expenditure, like Dr. Yagana has cited. Schools are established no, um, uh, with, uh, within an area of low population density, and then there are no uh, children to enroll to that school. Okay, that brings me to the next question, yeah, yeah, which is finish. just uh, a comment, please, uh, that most communities mm. in northern Borno you know, live in dispersed settlements, yes. you know, which may therefore hinder the sighting of facilities, yes. as we've just mentioned, yes. such as schools, clinics, etc., yes. in such scattered locations. Yes. So is there a need for this situation to be adjusted for them to benefit from accessing uh, essential services? And if so, how can this be accomplished? Yes, this can be accomplished. Government has to work out a sort of a, 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 a sort of a modus operandi on how to bring about development closer to people in terms of education and healthcare facilities. Dr. Omar has clearly cited that you need mapping of schools. Where are schools going to be cited? That is what he is saying by mapping. It is it implies a kind of strategic planning. You have to plan. You don't just go and establish school in Yeoma Wango or anywhere where there are no, no, no children, the population are always uh, depend on hiding. Um, some of them are reluctant to go to school. The uh, special uh, basic education uh, unit cannot even supervise um, the number of teachers deployed to that area. They don't know whether the teachers that are on the payroll of such primary schools um, whether they report to work or not. And then um, the infrastructure is widespread But, but, but what about bringing about people living in close proximity to, to, to live that, in that, that one brings, settlement? That brings me to the colonial notion of grouping the settlement into development units. You see, in, even in terms of uh, education, providing colonial education, the colonialists between 1915 to 1951 cited primary school in almost all the districts of Borno Emirate, including northern Borno. What they did, they did was to cite one primary school in a district headquarter, and then you enlist the children from the various village units. Every Lawan or district head um, constituting a particular district unit is given child enrollment target to produce child for enrollment to that school. And that system worked perfectly. And it is even easy supervision because it's easy supervision and easy identification of the peoples. They know the, the peoples who are enrolled from various village units to that particular school. Even in terms of healthcare facilities, villages can be grouped into development units in order to bring them closer to accessing government facilities. But once the settlement are dispersed and government say, I must provide healthcare facilities to each village, that will cost government a lot of money. And as Dr. Omar Goni has rightly said, the infrastructure food in close will, will end up being wasted. Termites will uh, destroy it. Um, horses and donkeys uh, have, uh, are, 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 yes, have taken over. 
as a place to uh, take their rest and what have you. Um, the school headmaster sometimes, if you go on supervision, is nowhere to be found within the, in the school. Um, if you ask him uh, what is the number of uh, students enrolled into his school, he doesn't know. The, the, the teachers enrolled to teach in that particular school are roaming about in the villages. Some are playing rubble, uh, rubble game, gambling. Some using motorcycle to get livelihood uh, through the Okada means, and what have you. So the issue of education, particularly in the rural areas, particularly northern Borno, where we are talking, needs rigorous effort to be reversed. Subeb must make sure that every primary school cited uh, on the list of Subeb must be properly supervised. Do we have a headmaster there? If a headmaster is posted there, does he go to work? If students are enrolled, do they attend classes? And how many times do they attend classes in a week? This kind of thing is that if Subiev cannot do it, they can set up committee, uh, a sort of committee to verify this kind of, uh, mm. this kind of thing. So that is it, but also... Before we, before we go to the, the Western uh, form of education, I think uh, the, the, the current knowledge that we have, we still have to harmonize it. Remember, in, in my first uh, statement, I made mention of uh, uh, literacy. Yes, this is understood, and you have already highlighted, and also she brought about some issues regarding that in, in another way, that uh, even those who are coming from other parts of the world to exploit the resources are illiterate in the sense that they haven't acquired Western education, but yeah. most of them come yes. with their own background of yeah. Islamic education. Yes. Yes. But yet they haven't stopped from you know, undertaking economic activities. Yes. So why is it that um, our own sort of uh, undertaking or our own you know, process of going through Islamic studies through our local malams have failed to sort of encourage people to, you know, go on to undertake some of these activities apart from knitting or, you know, caps and other things. Why is it that they can only be deployed to their teachers or malam's farm to produce for the malam only, but not to teach them skills in order for them to you know, advance their economic lives after attaining the education, the Islamic education? Yeah. Why, is it, why, 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 why is it failing? Well, it is only our, our understanding. The people's understanding is very poor toward these people. Otherwise, once an individual who can be able to read and write, we, we, we define that person as uh, literate. Then there is need for government to come up with either uh, agency for mass literacy, maybe through these things. They may, since Nigerian, like this thing is, uh, 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 we have to. But, but the literacy level of our own uh, Islamic scholars is only just to study the Quran, and the, the, the scope is not widened enough for them to, you know, explore certain areas, so as for them to understand yes. that, uh, you know, uh, they can use that ajami yes, and to, uh, to, yeah. to read and write write letters and uh, do some other things and you know what, the scope of yes. yes what I want to add to this yes. is that let the the, the agency for mass literacy, literacy come in in addition to what they have in addition to the the Quranic knowledge and then the ajami writing and so on and so forth in in addition to that let the the agency for mass literacy come in and then incorporate them so long as a, a Nigerian system is, a, is Western education, is Westernization. So we have to incorporate them into these things. If you leave them with their Quranic, Quranic uh, just in Sangaya and whatever, who are going to employ them? Nobody will going to employ them. Dr. Yagana, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, Nobody, let me, let me love this. Okay, Nobody will going to employ them. Yes. Uh, as you uh, rightly mentioned, they'll end up knitting cap. They'll end up, you know, uh, uh, doing other things, maybe nail cutting and then and so on and so forth. And this, this, this thing is not sufficient for them. Mm -hmm. So there is need for the, the agency 
to come in and marry them into the system. Incorporate. Yeah. Yes, into yeah. the this, this system. Yes. Then from there, then they will be utilized. They will be, they will be useful. So what, what is required is that uh, the agency will not only be seen to be operating within Maiduguri, but they have to deploy much of their staff and I, their I, resources I, to the hinterland. Yes, uh, but I think, I think we have uh, uh, Islamic studies, uh, uh, higher Islamic in, uh, in other sites. And in high Islamic, what they used to, high Islamic studies, what they used to do here is um, the where? women, Maiduguri here. In Maiduguri? Yes. But not in the places where they are required. If you are looking for knowledge, you have to travel. You have to travel, yes, but uh, to. when you have... Government has to do that. Yes. Government has to Let provide an avenue. Yes. yes. Okay, government but has... I'll come. Well, I want Dr. Yagen also government, to... Government yes. has to provide yes. these things. Yes. So he has to uh, 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 create an avenue yes. for them to maybe bring them here, or they should build school there that maybe high Islamic, uh, they have a background of, of education, yes. Islamic yes. education, yes. you understand? Mm, they have a background of Islamic education, yes. so maybe they will be you know, uh, 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 food into maybe class four or okay. three, then yeah. from that they will continue. Then they will write uh, Zaria, is it Zaria? High Islamic studies? Grade yeah. two? Yes. They will write grade two. And in Kano also. Somebody, of somebody who, has, who can yeah. memorize yeah. Brand of it. Yes. I believe the little Western education will. Of course. It's not something to them. Of course. So they can sit down. What more do you it. want to add? Um, in relation to what he has said, yes. I think we have emphasized the role of government and yes. what God, government needs to do. Yes. So what do the people have to do? They have to take ownership for their own development. Yes. At the end of the day, it has to be a kind of a bottom-up yes, approach. Yes, yes. And for that to be achieved, there needs to be a complete attitudinal change, complete reorientation. Because there are some things that um, our own people do not easily engage in. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you go to the shows of the lecture, you find people from another area, another different tribe more than our own? Why is that so? There are some people with enough Islamic education, but they feel with that they, they cannot just embark or mm -hmm. do some jobs mm -hmm. which they the feel is they kind of inferior yeah. mm -hmm. inferior yes. and then somebody comes and seizes that opportunity mm -hmm. and you see the persons economically improving mm -hmm. and all that and so our people need that orientation that ownership i was in a village where it was but, but don't you feel that they needed also leadership somebody that yeah, will that, now is, that is the role of government we're talking about that is it government will come in and play the role yes and give the needed direction. direction. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, yes. government cannot completely do everything. No. We must also live mm. up to our own expectations. expectations. Yes. And that is what is fundamentally lacking. Then what is the role of the opinion leaders, community leaders? The community leaders, the traditional rulers, all yes. have a, a role to play in terms of advocacy, in terms of creating awareness among the people on the need for us to take things uh, in this changing world and move forward with the rest of the world. But unfortunately, despite the Islamic education we're talking about, and there may be the limited uh, Western education, our attitude does not seem to be forward looking. And that has constrained a lot of the efforts that um, are being uh, uh, needed yeah. to get that fundamental change. Mm -hmm. So for education, there must be a kind of a holistic integrated approach mm -hmm. whereby we are looking at basic needs of water and um, other water and other needs have to be provided by government and then people can now uh, um, send their kids to school, especially the girls can attend schools more than at any other time because of uh, yes. And, and that. I, yes, thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't you feel that also lack of you know, the government's deliberate policy that will now, you know, encourage the people to uh, make it attractive to go to school to them. By example, you know, taking some of the institutions that have been over-concentrated within central Borno and southern Borno to the northern Borno, which is lacking in any tertiary institution. Mm. You know, is it also?